Good morning. Welcome to Pine Grove Baptist Church today. I, my name is Jared. I am the pastor of this church, and it's a privilege to be worshiping with you on this day, giving praise, honor, and worship to our King and Jesus. If you're sitting in the room or listening online and you had no idea why we sang about blood and this guy named Jesus, you're in the right place. It is the blood of Christ Jesus that bought our freedom from slavery. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that redeems us and reconciles us to a holy God. It's the blood. So don't be turned off. You're in the right place. I pray that you open your ears, fix your eyes on the truth of our Savior Jesus Christ. You picked a fantastic Sunday to be present. Life Happens is our teaching series currently, and I start with this observation, and it's certainly true for me, maybe it is true for you, but I am finding that life is tough. Life is hard. Uh, Specifically, pain is an international language that we all understand. If you're a believer, a non-believer, if you're wealthy or poor, white, black, or brown, educated, uneducated, it doesn't matter where you stand, pain touches every one of our lives. But how we respond to pain, how we move forward through the pain, differentiates between the believer and the non-believer because the believer has the hope of Jesus Christ. And while life is tough and life is hard, and many times most have been dealt a difficult hand that is just too hard to play, it seems to be unthinkable to pick up and continue pressing forward when these hurts in our lives haunt our hearts, when hang-ups cause us chronic pain. When our habits that we so want to kick and move forward seem to sabotage our happiness, what do we do? What do we do? That's where we find ourselves in this series. It has been a representation of a ministry entitled Celebrate Recovery. Through the ministry of Celebrate Recovery, hurts are healed, habits are, are, are transformed, and, and, and moving us forward in the freedom that Jesus Christ has bought and paid for us through the precious blood. For those unfamiliar with Celebrate Recovery, it is defined as such a biblical and balanced program that helps people overcome hurts, hang-ups, and habits. It is based on the actual words of Jesus rather than psychological theory. So, Pastor, it's like AA or or NA or a 12-step program. Yes, there are similarities to that, but we unashamedly tell you that the higher power you're seeking is Jesus Christ. Until you make right with Jesus and are reconciled to God the Father, you will chronically live in the pain and confusion of this world. But there's hope in Jesus Christ. The, the, the heart of this ministry is beyond just Pine Grove Baptist Church. It is to be a lighthouse and a beacon of hope in a community, a tri-county community that is without hope. That seems to be helpless. But you and I have the solution. We have the remedy. We have the prescription. It is Jesus Christ. And what better privilege as ambassadors for Christ than to share the hope through a ministry entitled Celebrate Recovery. Pastor, I've been hearing you talk about this for weeks. When is it kicking off? It is kicking off Tuesday night, April the 4th. Right here in this building, in the fellowship hall behind us at 630. Pastor, I have children. Will there be child care? Yes, there will be. 6.30, it begins, men and women, you don't have to be a member of this church, you can just live in this community, come and find the hope and the freedom in this safe place for God's grace. As we start in the specifics of our sermon, I give honor to two men, John Baker and his work, his book, The Healing Choices, and Pastor Rick Warren for his sermon series entitled The Road to Recovery. Our sermon content builds right off of their works, and I'm so thankful for each of them. Having said all that, setting up our sermon this morning, we find ourselves in the New Testament book of Mark chapter 14. If you have brought a Bible or an electronic device open to Mark, it's New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 14. If you did not come prepared with a Bible, I'm going to provide it on the overhead. I'm reading this morning from the New American Standard Bible, NASB. However you came this morning, I want to invite you to stand to your feet for the honor and reading of God's holy word. If you're physically able, please stand together as we read today Mark chapter 14, just a few verses, beginning in verse 36 and finishing in verse 38. The setting, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. He has brought a few of his close disciples there to be praying. Judas the betrayer is, is en route with his mob of angry men, Jesus has told the disciples to pray. 
we find these words beginning in verse 36. And Jesus was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. If you're unfamiliar, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross of Calvary. He is fixing to bear the full weight of sin since the beginning of time was going to be placed on Jesus Christ. Why would he do that? Because he loved you and me. And he was the only, the only solution to the penalty of sin was a sacrificial perfect lamb that shed the blood. Jesus knew this was coming and he prayed, Father, remove it, but not my will be done, yours. He comes back in verse 37 and he finds them sleeping. He says to Peter, yo, Simon, why are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Verse 38, keep watching and praying so that you will not come into temptation the spirit is willing, but oh, the flesh is weak. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before your mighty throne room of grace, and as a people in a posture of humility and a cry of dependency to you and you alone, God, we pour out our hearts and we pour out our praise and we pour out our thanksgiving to you, God, for this very day. For King Jesus that bore the sins, that was placed in a tomb that rose on the third day and has ascended into heaven, we thank you for our Savior Jesus. As we lean in for these moments of truth from Mark chapter 14, Father God, we pray that you open our eyes and affix our hearts to your words and your truth. Let no deception, let no deceit, let no destruction from Satan be present, and we rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ, but we invite the mighty Spirit of God, your Holy Spirit, to be free, moving forth and speaking challenging and directing we praise you king jesus in these moments and say thank you and the people of god said amen, amen. again please take your seat i know we're not starting in uh the beatitudes where we've been the last few weeks we're going to kind of pause out of that and look at the this healing choice in a different light from mark chapter 14 we'll come back to this in just a few minutes but i want to build up and set the stage for us have you ever found your Instagram feed to be a bit misleading. Like you, you flip and you scroll and you see photos of open Bibles, you see pious quotes, you see snappy theological one-liners, and you make the assumption that spiritual growth is pretty easy. Like cup of coffee, open Bible, nice phone, you got a selfie because you look great at 5 a.m. in the morning, and we all look at you thinking, man, they got it going on. What are they doing that I'm not doing? Because what I'm experiencing is super hard. I have good intentions, and my motivations tend to be pure, but man, it's a struggle. Anybody live there? Hashtag struggle bus with the spiritual growth? It's hard. Many times it's two steps forward and then five steps back trying to get back to where we once were, what where we once were. It's hard. Spiritual growth, though sometimes can be leaps and bounds, many times it's the painful struggle forwards, backwards, up and down, trying to make right as we are growing in Christ. We fall back into old patterns, although we don't want to go there, we find ourselves there. And the sobering reality is that spiritual growth and change in general is terribly, terribly hard. The recovery, the freedom, the healing that we are searching many times is elusive, like trying to grab the wind in our hands. We run into problems. We find ourselves in stressful situations. There's difficulties we didn't expect. And we respond by going back to self-defeating patterns. You been there? You, you swore it off. I'm never going to do. I'm never going to go back. I'm not going to reply to, to that, that post. And you find yourself sitting there in self-defeating patterns. Pastor Rick Warren identifies these patterns as relapse. Now, you're like, I've, I'm not a drug addict. I, I don't have a problem with alcohol. I, I don't relapse. Hold up before you go there. Relapse is not just for a chemical abuse or an addiction it could be an overeater that goes back after they've lost the weight and gains it back. It could be a gambler that swears off gambling that finds themselves right back in the casino. It could be a workaholic that fills up their schedule yet again, overcommitting themselves after they swore they would not. Yes, it could be the alcoholic that gives up the bottle that goes back to the bar, or the drug abuser, or the womanizer. It's any pattern or behavior that we go back to and we relapse. It's super easy 
to slip back into those patterns. At least that's what I'm finding in my life. And just so you think I'm not being spiritual, Paul writes about this, although he doesn't use the word relapse, I challenge you to go to Romans chapter 7 and begin in verse 19 and read to the end of the chapter and see if Paul's example of wanting to do different but going back and doing what I don't want to do, if that's not a picture of us relapsing. You're like, well, I picked a fine day to be at church. Relapse? You bunch of alcoholics? No. We are a bunch of sinners in need of a Savior. Yes, your issue might be alcohol, and my issue may be gossiping, and yours may be overeating, and others may be overspending. We all struggle because we were born with a sin nature that only Jesus Christ can correct. But here's the truth. Even when you find Jesus, it's still a struggle to move forward and to kick the old habits and the flesh that haunts you daily. That's where we are. So we speak life into these situations, being honest, hey, it's hard. But what do we do? That is the hope this morning. I I, I hope to answer two questions. One, what causes relapse? Why do I keep finding myself in these self-defeating patterns? But then secondly, how do we avoid? What can we begin doing intentionally to maybe sidestep the relapse? But before doing that, Pastor Rick Warren had had an astute observation of the relapse pattern. And I I read these things, and I'm like, man, that hits it it right on the head. I I share them with you. The pattern that happens, and many times we're unaware, it begins with complacency. Complacency. You get comfortable with short-term gains. This is the language that you begin sharing. I don't need any any more help. I don't need to go to those meetings. I don't need to participate and celebrate recovery. My pain has been reduced. Although it's not eliminated, it's manageable. And I don't need to take the precautions that I used to take. Complacency. Check this out. The more successful you are, the greater the temptation to fall back is where you once were. Could you, I mean, think about it. The more successful that you find yourself, the greater the temptation to fall back because you have become lackadaisical with the issues that have plagued you. You got it whipped, you think, and you become complacent. And that complacency builds a bit of confusion. Again, the the, the words in the, the mind are rationalizing your situation. Maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Ask your spouse when you have drank your paycheck away and you can't make your car payment if it was as bad as it was. Ask whomever you want to ask. Ask the loved ones that have been touched and hurt by your addictions, habits, hurts, and hang-ups to see if it really was that bad. The confusion happens when you begin to tell yourself, it wasn't that bad. Oh, it was, it was okay. It wasn't that big of a problem. I can handle it. Complacency, confusion, and then bam, compromise. You go back to the very place that has bit you time and time again. You think you can belly up at the bar and eat pretzels and peanuts and have no issue when you're a recovering alcoholic. The Word of God calls you a fool. You think you can run with your American Express card and run through the mall and swipe, swipe, swipe and then get a fat bill and you have no way to pay it and you wonder, how'd this happen? Compromise. We go back to those places that we think we can handle, and like old pit bull that jumps on that bone and will not let go, you find yourself sucked in and compromising what you said you would not do. You have found yourself relapsing because you've abandoned the principles and the discipline in front of you. Please note the collapse, the moment of taking the sip or injecting the pill or calling that woman or going to that website, whatever it is, those moments, that's not the collapse. The collapse started way back in the complacency when you let go and became undiligent with what's before you. So to that point, I bring us, what causes a relapse? I think many of us can say, yeah, I've been there. I've done that. I don't like it. I've got the t-shirt and the scars to show. But just to add some light as to observation of human behavior. Why is it that we relapse? Number one is this. We revert back to willpower. Willpower. Willpower 
in the long term wears you down and leaves you exhausted and defeated. You ever tried to just, just muster through? Some of you have been cold turkey and quit the habit, but it is far and few between. Willpower wears down. But notice this. It's not just your actions that go wayward after you break from the fatigue. Eventually, your beliefs follow. A person who does not change their actions will eventually have to change their beliefs because their conscience cannot take living a double life. Pastor Jason Isaacs shared that with, I read that from him. A person has to eventually change their beliefs because their behavior is not lining up. Reverting to willpower. Secondly, you refuse help. Why do we find ourselves in, in, in relapse? Refusing help. And it's not just help in general. It's those, those places of community and accountability and relationships that are keeping you encouraged, keeping you accountable, moving in the directions that God has called you to do. You begin to throw them off. You don't need to participate. I don't need to go. I don't want to do this any longer. And you avoid those people and you think, I got this. I'm under control. And that's the time it bites. Can I just add an observation to you? Even though as a Christian community, we build places of, of community with accountability, accountability is only as good as the person's heart. A person bent on sinning will circumvent the system because no system is perfect. You can sit in a group with a group of men and walk around the circle and you can confess and you can boldface lie. And we really wouldn't know the difference because we're not walking with you. We don't know what you have done this week. So any system of accountability can be circumvented because there's sin in our heart. Refusing the help, refusing to put yourself in a place of vulnerability and being open causes relapse. Lastly, thirdly, pride. Pride drives us to stumble. Pride drives us to relapse. Proverbs tells us in verse, chapter 16 and verse 18, pride goes before destruction. The haughty man is going to fall off the horse and hurt himself. Jared's paraphrase. Pride. Pride says, I, 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 I've got this. I, I don't need your help. I've got this habit kicked and this, this wound licked. I don't need nobody. Beware. I'm finding, again, as I am growing as a child of God and as, as your pastor, humility is the antidote for pride. Humility is what keeps us from stumbling. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But humility is needed to fight pride because humility is needed for learning. When you're prideful, you got it all figured out. You don't need anybody telling you what to do. You don't need any process or steps or accountability because you got it. But that's Satan's deceit. That's Satan's lie. He has built you up. He has puffed up your mind to think that you can do it by yourself. It's hard to learn when you know it all. So I'm like, <laughs> do I laugh at that? I don't know. But you know who you are. You're the, situ you're the person in the room that never shuts your mouth when we're all talking. We can talk about astrophysics. We can talk about gardening. We can talk about tractors. We can talk about beach balls. And you know everything. And I'm just, just an observer of human behavior. You just <laughs> stop talking. It's hard to learn when you know it all. And that's, that's the struggle in submitting yourself to a process, a, a system of recovery, a group of people. You have to position yourself that I don't know everything and I need help. I need help first and foremost from God through Jesus Christ. And I need help from you men or you women to keep me accountable. Please let us be children of God that are yearning and growing, not know-it-alls and spiritual hypocrites. Hey, relapse, willpower, refusing help, pride, which leads us to our healing choice number seven. The series has been built around these incremental choices. You get a choice in the matter. That's the beauty of our God. But choice number seven in this journey of, of freedom and breakthrough says, reserve a daily quiet time with God for self-examination, Bible reading and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life. And someone right now is thinking, oh, goodness. Here's this preacher again talking about quiet time and Bible reading. I hope you listen closely because i got an encouragement for you, for you. Hey, 
Healing choice number seven brings us to the second question. How do we avoid a relapse? We've looked at some causes, we've looked at some patterns, but what can we do? Like the practicality, the Monday morning, tomorrow, what do we do? Go back to, to Mark chapter 14 and verse 38 one more time and notice, notice Jesus' words. It says, keep watching and praying so that you will not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I recognize the context is, is pre-crucifixion, but Pastor Rick made this observation. Jesus is saying it is human nature to have a relapse, to go back to the things that mess us up, even though we know they mess us up. I know this is going to hurt. I know it's going to cause destruction, but I'm back here anyways. I'm doing this. Jesus said you have to build some safeguards, watch and pray, some safeguards that help protect you in a sense, insulate you in a sense against the temptation that is upon us. In fact, that's just a carry forward off of the healing choice number seven, these safeguards. Pastor, what, what are they? And I shared them with you. Number one is this, the discipline and practice of evaluation. I don't know where, I just scratched that. Let's start with this. Do you know your triggers? Do you know your proclivities? Do you know your patterns that lead to destruction. And you can smile awkwardly because and act like you don't know what I'm talking about, but we, let's just be honest, we know what those issues are. We know how we find ourselves back with the empty bottle. We know how to dial the dealer's number to hook up with the deal. We know where to go on the website to find the illicit. We know, we know, right? Evaluating. Step back for a moment. If you're driving in your car and that little red light says check engine, what do you do? You put a Band-Aid over it and you keep driving. I didn't see it. What are you talking about? I hope you don't do that. Your fuel light comes on. You need to get gas. And if you're like my wife, you know exactly how many more miles you have till it is like out of gas. Don't be that person. Observe the signs. Observe what's happening. or Evaluate what's going on. Listen to it closely. Your body is a barometer of what's happening inside of you. Your body is telling you what is going on as you're evaluating these triggers. Tired or, or hungry, stressed out, depressed, lonely, angry, scared, bored, overwhelmed. These all and much more can be clues that your life has gotten out of whack and you are walking to a path of destruction ahead. Do you take time to evaluate what is happening inside of your body? No, that's crazy. I ain't got time to do that. Your body is screaming at you, and many times we ignore it, and then we find ourselves at the, the, the threshold of temptation and destruction, and you're like, well, gee, Giggers, how did I get here? Because you ignored the signs that were around you. Do you evaluate what's going on? Are you aware of your triggers? If you've never done that, take the time this afternoon and just evaluate the steps that led to the, the act. How was I feeling? What was said to me? Was I lonely? Was I hungry? Was I angry? Was I retaliating? Your triggers. Know your triggers, but watch out for your justification. What is your justification? What do you mean, Pastor? You're smart, and you're savvy. If you're not careful, you get into a point that you're going to justify your sinful decision and even your sinful lifestyle and give some theological words to prove and again justify your decisions. You played that game? Maybe you haven't. I'm sorry. I talked to the wrong room. We face the same struggles as every Christian since the beginning of time. Obedience in the face of what feels incredibly inconvenient and unfair. That's not new for us 21st century believers. The Word of God tells us time and time again to obey the Word of God. If you're reading your, your one-year Bible and you started in the book of Deuteronomy, began, I think, Thursday and Friday, chapters 4, 5, and 6, 
It has repeatedly told us to obey, obey, and obey. If you read the text, it is hard to see that we're to be obedient to God. But we justify because the decision in front of us is inconvenient and unfair. Again, Pastor Jason Isaacs adds this observation. Subconsciously, when we want to sin, you can figure out clever ways to justify your actions. Given enough time, you can create convincing reasons why God does not require the same from you as he does from everybody else. You justify your sinful behavior. What does that look like? I had a thought, but I don't want to share that because it's weird. I don't know what your justification is, but I know I played the game with God. And every time it falls short. And if you're in a position that you're having to rationalize and justify actions and decisions, wake up. The check engine light is blinking at you. The fuel light has come on. Stop and evaluate. God, what are you saying to me? How do we avoid a relapse? Start with evaluation, but then move into meditation. I mean, like those guys that put up their fingers and cross their legs and they go, mm, mm, no. That's not, that's not meditation. Meditation, specifically out of our Old Testament, means to focus. The activity is to slow down long enough to hear God speak to you. But say, you have an enemy. And I don't know where you fall on the, the belief of God and Satan, good and evil, but let me just crack your bubble. Satan's real. And his tactics to cause destruction in your life is to introduce noise or crowds and hurry. Keeping you busy and preoccupied takes away from you slowing down and meditating by focusing on God. Slowing down long enough to hear God speak to you. I ask this question, and I know it seems silly, but do you, not really a question, more of a statement. Do you know prayer is more than asking God to do things for you? Prayer is more than treating God like a genie up in the sky, getting you out of binds, praying over and protection. And those are good things, hoping you for wisdom and guidance. But it's more than asking God for doing things in your life. Prayer is communicating with God, you to God and God back to you. So you're evaluating and then you introduce meditation, which means to slow down long enough to hear God speak. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can do that, Pastor. I've got a, a great encouragement to you. You can't meditate, but can you worry? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. I got a ribbon in, in school for, like, best worrier. My superlative in the senior yearbook was best worrier. Hashtag this guy. If, why are you saying that? If you can worry, which is focusing on a negative event, focusing on a future un realized activity, then you can meditate. It's just focusing on something else. Meditation's focusing on the Word of God. Medi- it worries focusing on an unrealized fear. So if you can worry, and I know many of you can, as I, as I can, we can learn the discipline of meditation. Let's very quickly listen. Psalms chapter 1, and beginning in, in verses 1 and 2, I read this to you uh, from the Old Testament. Get over there. Psalms chapter 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But blessed is the man that delights in the law of the Lord, the word of God, and his law he meditates day and night. So we begin in the book of Psalms, which really is just a worship book of praise and honor to God. But he says, blessed is the one that reads, and blessed is the one that meditates. I ask you this, is meditation a part of your spiritual discipline? Don't answer the question. I know the answer. It's not. But why? Pastor Charles Stanley adds this observation. God gave the practice of meditation not just to preachers, but to all his children, so that we might better relate to him. Personal, private meditation begins when we get alone with the Lord and get quiet before Him. See, I told you in healing choice number seven, the implication is a quiet time with God. And you rolled your eyes and you shrugged your shoulders. Because internally, you know you don't have the time to do what the Word of God tells you to do. So you feel guilty. 
Or if you do it, it is so rushed that after you read Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, and Proverbs, and you walk away, you have no clue what you just read. But you feel good that you've done it. Meditation. I I can't make you do it. Obviously, that's not my job. That's between you and God. I can give you best practices. But why is it so important to meditate? Because God wants to talk to you. As the previous illustration of the guy that never shuts his mouth because they know everything, don't be the guy in prayer that's always talking to God and not sitting in silence and letting God speak to you. But the secret is to create margin around the time that you spend with God. I'm not going to say it's useless, but trying to do a full Bible study and talking and listening in silence in a matter of six minutes between the kids getting up and having to start breakfast, you're wasting Something is better than nothing, but there is so much more in the relationship with Jesus and God our Father when you make the time to plant the bottom, to open the Bible, to be still and silent and meditating on the bread of life. Because this is what I'm learning. We do a really good job in church, specifically Baptist churches, of doing for God. We do a horrible job of being with God. But the secret is, We are to be with God that spills into the doing for God. And we wonder why the churches are such, hmm, we wonder why the state of the church is so apathetic for people of God that have no more desire to be with God because we're not spending the time with them before we start doing. Am I to beat you up? No. I'm trying to help you see that there is beauty when you stop and meditate. Pastor, what does that look like? One more time, Psalms chapter 119 and verse 11. I read from the New Living Translation, excuse me, the Living Bible. I have tried my best to find you. Don't let me wander off from my instructions, from your instructions. I have thought much about your words and stored them in my heart so they would not hold me back from sin. Blessed Lord, teach me your rules. Pastor, I don't, I don't see what, what we're supposed to be doing Inside of Psalms 119 is the implication of Scripture memorization. Now, I know you're like, I, my, my, I, you can't teach the new dog, uh, you can't teach the old dog new tricks, <laughs> however you classify yourself, and I get that. But we can play some music from the time that you were a teenager or early, early adulthood and start jamming, and you can start singing right along, and it was maybe 20 years ago. Why is it those songs catch? Because it takes you back to an event and an environment and the rhythm and the music. Scripture memorization is a tool in your spiritual warfare. Did you know that? When you go back to, and don't do this right now, but make a note in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Paul is describing the armor for spiritual warfare. And at the end of that, in verse 17, he tells us to put on the helmet of, of our salvation, followed by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Interesting fact to you, word is rima in the Greek New Testament. It means the spoken Word of God. Context, when you're fighting in spiritual warfare, you are to speak the Word of God against the enemy, for the victory is in the Word of God. Well, how do you get that? You're going to pull out your phone and you're going to pull, uh, Satan and the uh, 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 Wi-Fi. It, no, it is buried in the mind and comes forth from the heart because you have taken the time to meditate and memorize Scripture. Pastor, I don't know what you got off this morning, but I ain't got no time to meditate. I ain't got no business memorizing Scripture. I got a busy life to live. Satan's tactic is to keep you busy and hurried. My prayer for you, for us, is to be people that desire to be with God before we go and do for God. To have the intimacy with the Father that I sit down and I have nothing before me but God in my silence. I pray that you examine my heart and speak to my mind. Does God do that? Take the challenge tomorrow morning. Set a clock, set your timer to three minutes and just sit there in silence and see what God says. Evaluate. Meditate, thirdly, to overcome or or help to prevent the relapse, we pray. Prayer. I read a story about a guy that was in Gainesville, and a Krispy Kreme sign was on. 
those of us that are donut fanatics, you know that means it's hot donuts. And hot donuts are the best with a cold glass of milk. But this guy was on a diet. And he knew, he knew that he should not park the car and go anywhere near Krispy Kreme. So he says this prayer, Lord, I know you don't want me to eat donuts. I know that's not your will, but man, I need you to confirm it. He added to the prayer a fleece of Gideon, per se. I'm going to drive around one more time, and if there's no parking spots available at Krispy Kreme Donuts, I know that is you speaking to me to keep on going and not to stop. Eight laps later, <laughs> a spot was open, and he knew God said, hey, go get your donut. Don't worry about your diet. Praying to God. We laugh. I tease. Let me read to you Mark chapter, verse, chapter 14, verse 38 from Eugene Peterson's translation, the Message Bible. Notice what it says. Stay alert, be in prayer, so you don't enter the danger zone without even knowing it. Don't be naive. Part of you is eager and ready for anything in God, but another part, your flesh, is as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. Man, what... What picture that brings to mind? The implication, of course, is prayer, but this tension between flesh and spirit, good and bad, ready to move, but yet something is, is lurking. Don't be naive. When Jesus says, keep watching and praying, in verse 38, I, I was intrigued by that. I, I came to the third part of this. I'm like, how does prayer keep us from relapsing? Because many times I'm praying in those moments. No, I'm really not. I mean, I've, I'm not praying at all. I can taste what I want. I can see where I'm going. I'm, I'm going to achieve. My blood pressure is raised. I'm beginning to, to perspirate. I, it, it, it's going to be good, but it's also going to be bad. But the good's going to outweigh the bad for just those few moments as I sink my mouth into that little Debbie Swiss cake. But he says to watch and pray. When you, again, as I struggle with this, praying, it's before you get into the danger zone. Which means we are to be praying proactively before we even get close to this area in our lives. But a different translation of be watchful and praying states this, be vigilant and worship. I'm like, man, if I took the time to worship Jesus, like I take the time to strategize the execution of my sin, and to fulfill the temptation that is burning within me, what would that look like? To be vigilant and alert and attentive to the things of God and the worship of God and a posture of prayer. And I had to just confess, I don't pray like that. I mean, my prayers consist of like blessing this food and protection over my children and guidance for me and my wife. And, but really, self-evaluating and stopping and saying, God, I want this, but before I go there, begin working in me. Do you do that? Is prayer that part of your spiritual discipline that you're fighting against? And not just a matter of, of nonchalantness, but a, a, a matter of attentive worship, that I want you, Jesus, more than I want this temptation. And I get it. You're like, yeah, I can say that every day, but when those moments arise, that's the last thing on my mind which I offer three suggestions as you are navigating the prayer and worship before you enter those danger zones of relapse and temptation. Number one is submission. I'm finding it is hard to submit when it's not a daily activity. In the moments that I'm tempted to go back to that, that area, but I haven't been submissive in the days previous or the weeks, it is a crying shame to think you're going to immediately have some strong Submission when you haven't been practicing that previously. Do you have a bended knee before God? Are you crying out to God every morning and saying, God, I know this about myself, that I am going to want this. In the name of Jesus Christ, I break off the spirit of, in the name of Jesus Christ, give me strength. Do you do that? Submitting and saying, God, I need your Secondly, self-denial. Self-denial is trusting God to meet the need that you think 
your temptations are going to meet. That really is the crux behind the relapse. You are finding the satisfaction in this and not believing God can do this for you. And then you excuse yourself, you rationalize your behavior, you justify your actions. But really it's denying this and wanting better from God. I just ask this plainly to you. Do you believe God has your best interest at heart? For the rest of you that didn't answer, let me just let me clarify for you. Yes. God has your best interest. God's will is best for you, but God can't make you take what's available before you. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because we are creatures of free will. Verse 36 is interesting. I don't have time to explain it, but Jesus submits himself to a will in heaven. Go back and read verse 36, which tells me that God has a will that is perfect and good and pleasing that he has written in the books of heaven, but is being held up on earth, waiting on you and I to request and to submit and walk in that reality. That God just can't come do it for us. We have to deny and submit. And then brings us lastly to self a discipline. The ability to say no. You know, Satan is powerful, but Satan cannot make you do anything. You know that? He's not going to put the bottle to your lips. He's not going to type in the website. He's not going to have you text that woman or respond. I mean, that's you. But you get the power through the submitting spirit to God to say no and to choose a better route. Is it easy? No. It's not. And it's going to cry in your face as you fight and move towards the purposes and principles of God. But what would it look like if we submitted daily, sought out reliance upon God, and saying no as we approach these areas of danger and temptation, overcoming by Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Eyes are closed, heads are bowing. Father God, we come to you now thankful that our power, our freedom is in the person of Jesus Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit. What Christ has won for us, he has given us the freedom through the Spirit of God to live as you have called us. Father, I recognize at the sound of my voice there are some that do not know you or your son Jesus, they don't have the freedom and the power, the liberty that is found in the blood of Christ. I want to speak to you right now. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed. If that is you and you know in your heart you don't have a relationship with God, I want to lead you in a prayer beginning a relationship with God through Jesus. It goes like this. Say this to yourself as I say it aloud. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner, and I confess I have fallen short of your standard. I believe Jesus is the Lord, and that he died on the cross for my sin. God, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead, and he is alive today. Right now, God, I humbly commit my life to Jesus and confess him as my Savior and Lord. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed. If you prayed that prayer to yourself silently as I said it aloud, will you just boldly raise up your hand? I don't want to cause any attention. Just keep your hand up for a second. Thank you. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed. Father God, for those that have raised their hand, we praise you. We rejoice in the decision for them to commit their life to you and have a relationship with you, Father God. I pray that their encouragement and their direction as a follower of Jesus to seek out baptism and how to grow as a child of God. Father, for the rest of us that sit having a relationship with you, I pray that your spirit speaks to us as we evaluate where we are with you, the areas of danger and temptation, and how to avoid relapse. Give us strength this day to be obedient. We love you, King Jesus. Amen.